everyone for coming. Um, today we are honored to present an interdisciplinary panel discussion on women's rights in conjunction with the exhibition which is on view in this gallery and also continues in the East Gallery titled Selections from Women's Rights Are Human Rights. This exhibition was organized and curated by Elizabeth Resnick, who is Professor of Graphic Design at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Before I introduce our panelists and moderator, I would like to extend some thank yous. First and foremost, this event would not be possible without the participation of the following faculty and staff who are here with us today. Um, Teresa Bivolitz, Dr. Srivita Kalaramama Dan, Dr. Beth Aunt Darlene Russell, Dr. Arlene Holt Scala, and, and Donalyn Scaleri. We value the opportunity to collaborate with faculty from across the university and draw upon their significant scholarship and valuable expertise. I would also like to thank the gallery staff, Emily Johnson, who's our gallery manager, and Casey Matherin, who's our collections manager and curator of visual resources for organizing this public program. In addition, our students, Jacqueline Portillo, Zoe Smolder, and graduate assistant, Angel Fosukeni, support to our operations. Um, and last but not least, we're grateful to the staff of Instruction Research and Technology for their technical support to record this event today. The format of today's panel will be that each panelist will speak for about five minutes and then there will be discussion um, moderated by our moderator. And then of course there will be time for questions from the audience. So now I'm going to introduce our um, panelists moderator. First, I'm gonna... First, I'd like to introduce our moderator, who's sitting at the end of the table closest to me, Dr. Arlene Holp Scala, who is chairperson of the Women's and Gender Studies Department here at William Patterson and also chair of the Faculty Senate. Her research interests include heterosexism, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered issues, the impact of race and class on student lives, and epistemological and pedagogical issues related to developing a human rights oriented ethos. She earned a doctorate in education from Teachers College at Columbia University. Next, everyone's seated in alphabetical order. So moving down the table, we have Teresa Bivalitz, who holds a master's degree in social work and is a licensed social worker who's been in the field of domestic violence and sexual assault as an advocate for the past 13 years. Um, at William Patterson University. She is the Campus Victim Services Coordinator. She provides advocacy and support to student survivors of abuse, coordinates prevention education, and organizes awareness and training events with various departments and student groups. Prior to arriving at William Patterson, she worked in, non in the nonprofit sector at several organizations serving survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. She also serves as secretary on the board of directors of the nonprofit, Unchained at Last. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Srivita Kalaramama Dan, who is an associate professor in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies. She received her master's degree in mass communications from Bangalore University, her master's in women's studies from Georgia State University, and her PhD in women's studies from the University of Iowa. Her book, Gender, Governance, and Empowerment in India, was published in 2016, and her latest journal article, Presence into Participation and Representation, Gender Quotas and Local Government in India, was published in the Journal of South Asian Development in 2018. Her areas of specialization include gender, state and politics, political participation, feminist theory, globalization, and South Asia. This semester she's teaching the course gender, the courses, gender and Islam, and the introduction to women's and gender studies. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Darlene Russell, who's a professor of English education in the College of Education. She is the founder of the Nurturing Culturally Responsive Equity Teachers Research Project, which focuses on implementing a culturally responsive and pro-social justice curriculum in secondary classrooms. 
Professor Russell, and NCRET scholars have presented at national conferences in over 15 states. She was the recipient of the William Patterson University's Woman of Vision Award in 2015. She is the author of the book, Seeing the Invisible, Reading Literature Through Critical Lenses, and collaborated um, to publish two books with students. Russell and her colleague, Dr. Kaba Kohli, were co-awarded a Fulbright for a group research project to Senegal. Her three months this past summer in Senegal was an amazing educational experience. Okay, um, last but not least, um, Professor Donna Lynn Scaleri is an adjunct professor at William Patterson, Kane, and New Jersey City Universities, working in the departments of Women and Gender Studies and the Department of Sociology. She consults on human rights as a professional speaker and by coordinating and moderating events about domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, bullying, teen dating violence awareness, gang violence awareness, military sexual assault, substance abuse prevention, and LGBT issues. Until recently, she was on the board of trustees of the NJCEDV and headed the LGBT task force. So, as you can see, we have a very accomplished panel. Um, so I'm gonna turn everything over to Dr. Scala now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Okay, so we're going to go in order and we'll have each presentation. And then um, um, Kristen and I develop some questions for the panelists and there'll also hopefully be time for you to ask questions. So we'll start with Ms. Bibblitz. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, this is a great exhibit with uh, lots of different visuals and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about domestic violence. I'm gonna talk really in, ter you know, in general terms and you know, as you, I'm sure, looked around and continue to look around, you'll see which ones uh, reflect domestic violence or violence against women. So I'm actually wearing a purple pin today, so uh, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It's October 1st, so it's the start of the month where we honor uh, victims who have lost their lives to domestic violence and we look to continue to provide support for survivors continuing to struggle with domestic violence in their daily lives. Um, as Kristen was telling you, I've been working in the field of domestic violence for a number of years. I've met with countless survivors from all walks of life, uh, young people to older generations, uh, I've met with kids who have grown up in homes where domestic violence was prevalent. And so I can tell you just anecdotally, but also statistically, domestic violence affects or can affect any type of person. It doesn't matter what you look like, where you grew up, um, what home environment you were in, uh, how much money you make, how much schooling you achieved. It can happen, unfortunately, to anyone. There are lots of different types of domestic violence. A lot of times people think that domestic violence has to leave some physical marker on your face as a sign of, of physical abuse. And that could be you know, a black eye, um, some other type of injury. But, if, but really, you know, realistically speaking, that doesn't happen in all types of abusive relationships. And I should also point out that abusive relationships just don't, don't only happen between married couples, heterosexual married couples. They can happen between <laughs> Uh, couples who are dating, same-sex relationships, trans people, so it can happen to people in all walks of life. And as you look around some of these, these posters, some of them may not in this room, hopefully you'll explore the ones that are in the room in the back, which have a few, I guess a little bit more of a um, graphic depic a depiction. You see that in a lot of domestic violence campaigns, they tend to focus on physical abuse, and while that's that can be okay because it grabs people's attention. They see bruises and injuries and blood and that draws people in to look more at the, that, that poster. But as I was saying before, physical violence doesn't happen in every abusive relationship or it, doesn't, or it might have happened once and it doesn't continue to happen. Uh, so I guess the good thing about those types of po posters is it draws people's attention in and then maybe they start to ask more about, you know, what is domestic violence all about? They start to question their own relationships and ask, you know, is my relationship healthy? Am I exhibiting any signs of domestic violence? Am I being controlling, you know, over my partner? Am I acting possessive? Am I, 
you know, am I being an equal partner in this relationship? And so I'm, I'm glad that we have these, these campaign posters. If you ever come to, into my office, and you're all welcome to stop by, my office is in the Women's Center on the third floor of the Student Center. You can see that I love posters. I have posters all over, over my office, ones that you know, show signs of healthy relationships, ones that show statistics on the overwhelming majority of men that would never perpetrate violence, because I, I like those posters as well that, that put it in the opposite lens. Uh, because sometimes people tend to think you know, it's, that all men can be abusive, and that, that's definitely not the case. So there's a spectrum of you know, the visual arts, I guess you can call it, of what, how it brings in people and how it get, um, catches people's attention. So I just wanted to share some statistics with you. Um, first, I want to talk about the Violence Against Women Act. So the Violence Against Women Act is a law in our country that provides funding for lots of different organizations throughout the country to reduce and prevent domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking. The first time that this act came into play was in, in 1991. And luckily, it's been reauthorized you know, up until present day. But unfortunately, there's no, there, it can never go smoothly. And we see right now it's up for reauthorization again. And I've worked in nonprofits and for many years in a few different ones. And unfortunately, or fortunately, we rely on funding from government assistance. And if agencies you know, don't receive this funding, more and more survivors or victims will not help the help that they deserve. There's already not enough room in shelters or safe houses for women and young children, so then they end up maybe on the streets or staying in the homes where they are unsafe. There's a couple of posters over to your right, our left, that say many women feel safer here than at home, and it shows a woman uh, you know, on a street mm -hmm. saying that, that she's homeless, she feels safer being there than she does in her home. So back to the to VAWA, Violence Against Women Act, it actually expired yesterday, it was set to expire. I guess the good thing, there's a caveat here, is they extended it for about 10 weeks until December 7th. There was really no need to expand it if we just had bipartisan support to you know, fix the issues that were involved in, in the act, to extend the funding to marginalized groups, to those who maybe are hiding in the shadows that you know, undocumented people, um, uh, Native Americans, they receive the least amount of funding. So that's a lot of the problems that we see when, when our funding's up for reauthorization. We want to continue to expand it. Some other statistics on a national level is that we see that about a quarter of women, one in four women, may experience a severe intimate partner violence, which includes physical violence or intimate partner con uh, sexual violence or intimate partner stalking and about one in nine men experience that same type of severe intimate partner physical violence. Uh, if you look at, um, I guess, less of a range of severe physical violence, if you look at domestic violence, all types of domestic violence, it increases to one in three women and one in four men experience some form of, of domestic violence. And that could go from um, control, emotional abuse, manipulation, economic abuse, financial abuse, using children as a pawn to gain control of their partner. In, well, this is interesting. I always like to say this. You know, there's hotlines for domestic violence. Luckily, there's na national and local hotlines. On a typical day, a domestic violence hotline, nation a nationwide hotline receives over 20,000 calls. 20,000 calls in just one day. In the state of New Jersey, they, they, re, they record data from, uh, from law enforcement. And so these are just reported. I want you to know that these are just reported uh, statistics. So in the year 2016, because that's the last um, data that they have compiled, there were over 63,000 domestic violence offenses reported by the police in that year, um, which unfortunately was a 3% increase from the year before. So 63,000, that's a lot. And again, that's a range of all different types of domestic violence. But that's just in one year. The most frequent day of the week for domestic violence incidents is Sunday, closely followed by Saturday. And if you had to take a guess as to why that is, 
Anybody want to take a guess at that? On a weekend? People are at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might be their, their day off from work. Mm -hmm. um, in these reported incidents, females were victims in 74% of the reported incidents. So those are just some New Jersey statistics for you. Uh, here at William Patterson, um, I offer services to survivors of dating abuse and sexual violence. I'm a confidential resource. So I work with students who are going through these things and help them to find the options that they need that are, that are best for them. I never lead anybody in one direction of what to do other than thinking and being the safest that they can be, making decisions that are gonna keep them safe. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I have for you right now. So I guess we'll move on to Dr. Kalaramadam. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bibbulitz. Okay, Dr. Kalaramadam. Okay, uh, if I could just help, uh, get help with the screen. Oh, Emily. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you, Kristen, for the invitation to be on this panel and to also my uh, co-panelists. And thank you, Teresa, for the work you do and the very important information you shared here today. I'm going to shift the focus a little bit on the exhibition of the posters. Um, and that one, okay, thank you. Um, so many of the posters um, you see uh, around here and in the room have been um, have been made by um, poster artists or um, ad agencies for particular causes um, around the world uh, to address questions of patriarchy, gender inequality, um, dignity of women in every society, etc. So these posters remind us of the connections between art and activism. Um, and precisely because they disrupt the political landscape. Um, in, wh in which they were made, in what they represent, and perhaps in the many locations that they circulate. Uh, reminding, me of, uh, reminding us of what uh, the playwright Brett said, that art is not a mirror held up to reality, but a hammer with which to shape it. I.e., I mean, how does culture get shaped through art? So that's a good, good question to keep as we uh, uh, take in these posters. Um, since the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, states have repeatedly emphasized the universality, the indivisibility, and the inalienability of human rights. So no nation state around the world can now ignore the fact that gender injustice is normal, natural, or legal. So you know, at least we've gone past that. The main theme of this exhibition, uh, which is women's rights or human rights, although made uh, you know, famous uh, 25 years ago at the global platform, uh, we must also be aware of the history uh, that post-World War II, uh, you know, post-colonial nations around the world, uh, people have organized for change, and grassroots organizations have also used uh, the, uh, the principle of women's rights as human rights. And perhaps it was brought to global focus, I think, at the Beijing conference by, um, uh, by Hillary Clinton. And that's what you know, we celebrate here today. So in this sense, I, this exhibition expresses or articulates the theme of solidarity. What does it mean to be in solidarity with women from other parts of the world or from different parts of the world? So I want to focus today on one aspect of this exhibition with respect to solidarity. And, and it is the need to attend to the context and the particular moments of claiming sisterhood. So for solidarity uh, needs to always acknowledge and respect difference while seeing similarity. It needs to understand how the global goes into the making of the local, how our lives are intertwined and yet our fates are different, and how we are independent and yet dependent. So the erasure of context in perhaps in so many of the posters here, and hence the problem of a glib sisterhood or a voyeuristic reading of oppression and solidarity is something that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to bring to focus here today. So let's look at the four posters. Uh, I'm going to pick four posters for um, an analysis. Um, I'm not sure if some of you saw this particular poster. It's not here. Perhaps it's, it's in the room inside. 
Um, so this was done by a Mexican artist, um, Eduardo Barrera Arambari. And um, he's an artist who works with a global reach who designs posters for cultural events and corporate design. So what is the context of this poster that one is able to see? Can you quickly tell me what you see? Feet and legs, okay. Um, okay, so what you see is feet and legs, which means the body is underground, buried, dead, dead women. Uh, so, uh, and this is in Juarez City. And perhaps some of you know um, symbolically, um, you know, what Juarez is known for. Um, and for those of you, if you're some of your business students, you know uh, what happens in, in Juarez. So what is the context we see here? We see um, that uh, you know, Juarez is a violent city which contributes to the larger context of Mexico itself is violent and uh, the comments made by the current person in, in power who said Mexicans are all rapists, right? So this, some of this comes from this location and from here. So what is missing then? So what do you see here and what you don't get is the context of Water City itself, that it's a global city produced by global entities. For those of you who don't know a quick um, geographical context of Juarez, it's a border town across the Rio Grande from Texas, and it, have, it has about 300 factories owned by Mexican, Asian, and US companies, which take advantage of Mexico's cheap labor and low tariffs that results from NAFTA. And this morning, you may have heard on BBC how the current, again, the president wants to um, you know, rethink um, NAFTA, and the question will be um, that, so this is about you know, free trade, and what is, is there another model that will replace it? Uh, so these factories along the US-Mexican border imports components that are then assembled into finished products for export to the United States. So these factories are commonly called the maquiladores. Majority of the maquila workforce comprise exclusively of women. So these are the women who work in the macula who die. And uh, the other fact of Mexico is that it's, um, you know, it does show high rates of femicide in the world. Uh, close to 3,000 women have gone missing since the mid-1990s, and it is a social justice and a human rights issue taken up by the Mexican women's movement. Uh, most victims, some as young as five years old, are found strangulate, strangled, mutilated, dismembered, stabbed, torched. Um, and, and as much as some of these reports are you know, sensationalized, what is missing behind this pandemic is the strange kinship between neoliberal economic measures, violence driven by organized crime, a very patriarchal approach to working women, um, and in this context, if you read more about what is happening in Juarez, you'll also see how the good woman and the bad woman, the woman who works outside, the woman who walks the streets, are constantly condemned as bad women. And that also plays into, um, and finally, the legal impunity around femicide in Mexico are all contributory factors to what we see here in this poster. So this is, in, in another way, the system that confers uh, control over women's sexuality to male factory workers, to male criminals, and to male authorities. So, so this is the context that one should also remember while seeing a poster like this. So let's take the, um, let's look at another poster. Um, so these are, this is a, these are three posters. You see two of them to your left uh, here in this room. Um, and uh, this is a poster that is made by Mamek Olegbi, again, a global ad agency, a multinational company that, um, that is one of the largest marketing communications network in the world, and they made these posters for the UN. So, um, so it's interesting um, what this poster, uh, so what do you see in this poster, quickly? Let's see, I see a woman being, women being silenced. Women being silenced, okay. It's um, basically three different women of different ethnicities, and they show like um, different types of questions that reflects on their ethnicity. Uh huh. Okay, three different questions. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure if you're able to see uh, the questions. 
so this is a Google search. So if you put women cannot, and you know these things come out. But well, how? Um, so what do these posters, um, you know, say to us at the first look? So these are about three faces, all silenced by the search link, but they are also visible, visible markers of identity and location, like you said, the three different ethnicities. So how do we read these three posters then? From a particular set of practices, the Euro-American women, and I think that would be the middle poster there, is sublimated by the verb cannot, which means not allowed to um, you know, drive or not be part of the church. Um, and the Arab America, the Muslim woman or the Arab woman, um, which is the middle poster here, um, you know, and the Asian woman stands for universal ideas of need to or should to. So this is this is what the search engine, um, you know, brings up. Uh, and need to or should should not, uh, just uh, you know, gestures towards something of an obligation or ideas of duty. Uh, so. How do we read this then? The first woman, um, particularly the Euro-American women, is given a context that she um, is, um, you know, uh, not allowed to drive. Now that's that's not even something that, you know, uh, is questioned here. You know, how many women are not allowed to drive? In fact, you're not allowed to drive only in the context of, say, a class position, not being able to afford. But that's not something that women are even thinking of, but the two things is their connection to the institution of the church, that they're not able to you know, be bishops or um, leadership in the, church, in the institution of the church. So, so the cannot drive then is how the Euro-American women build solidarity with women out there. Remember this is also the context in the 90s um, and early 2000s when Saudi Arabian women you know, were not allowed to drive, although now they are. And so a way to connect with the women there is to bring, uh, you know, is, is through the solidarity of, um, you know, uh, they are not allowed to drive, so we stand with our sisters there. Uh, but this also, it's also important to bring to light here the context of uh, precisely this building of solid, uh, global sisterhood in which Laura uh, Bush, uh, you know, uh, talked of the justification of going to Afghanistan as saving the brown women from the brown man. Mm -hmm. uh, so if only we uh, unveiled her in those contexts, will she be free and empowered? So these posters do come around that time and in, in a way, you know, speaking to that, what was happening um, in, in the public discourse. Um, whereas what is happening to the Muslim women or the Asian women, and the Asian women is uh, that particular poster is in the brochure of uh, the, uh, the, the exhibition, so do check it out on the website. Uh, now both are in a way objectified and universally trapped in their oppression, meaning it's their culture, that they are within the kitchen, that they are, um, uh, you know, um, I, I, I'm unable to read, but you see in the in the in the last poster that when you put women shouldn't. So those are the, some of the ways in which the cultural context of her living come, whereas the uh, the Euro-American woman has some agency about not being a fighting to be part of institutions. So again, the context what is lost is how are the other women in their own context fighting for change and fighting for empowerment. So that is perhaps lost in, in uh, this. So let me just move, uh, let me move then to the third poster. Now, you may see one of them in the inside room, but these are the two other posters that are also in the brochure that you can take a look. Um, so these, this was an award-winning campaign by a Mumbai-based and film agency uh, called Taproot India in 2013, and they made this, um, uh, you know, they uh, made this campaign for Save Our Sisters, which is a project initiated by Save the Children, again a global um, non-governmental uh, non organization, and the project focuses on prevention of sex trafficking. But and the advertisement, uh, the advertisements present images of the three primary goddesses of Hindu mythology. Uh, so who you see, and many of you may not be familiar with this, but uh, you see the three goddess Durga, who's the goddess of valor, Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. Okay, so, and the copy of the ad read, uh, quote, pray that we never see this day. Today, more than 68% of women in India are victims of domestic violence, 
Tomorrow it seems like no women shall be spared, not even the ones we pray to. End quote. So this was the campaign again that came close on the heels of the 1992 um, gang rape that was very well um, not only publicized but also the nation came out against and we had significant changes in the law. Uh, and this was also globally known as an incident. So this was um, a part of that uh, as a response to that incident. Uh, so what do we see here? So at first look, for those of you who may not uh, uh, you know, know of Hindu mythology, some of the things that stand out may be that these are images of uh, goddesses, lighter in complexion in a country with darker shades of skin color for most, most people, icons and goddesses who are revered, they are symbolic of the mother nation, uh, otherwise mother India, and that they were respected in the days bygone and now they are sullied and attacked in the public. Um, so to pray that they are saved from the violent patriarchal society. So those are perhaps some of the first things that you can get from these images. Um, but what does this not reveal then? Yes, um, you know, 340,000 crimes against uh, women are reported uh, yearly by the National Crimes uh, Bureau and the conviction rate is low and this is not peculiar to India, it is similar to many parts of the world. Uh, where there are uh, violence again, uh, where violence against women are recorded, and the BuzzFeed um, notes a very, um, um, you know, a, a significant distinction that the campaign simply and effectively captures India's most dangerous contradiction, that of revering women in religion and mythology, while the nation remains incredibly unsafe for its women citizens. Um, however, this particular campaign did have its detractors. The feminist community itself responded very differently. So, uh, and these are uh, groups, organizations, and women who are organizing for change at the grassroots level. And they have always maintained that prayer is an insufficient, actionable solution to violence. You know, prayer is not enough. So many question the representational tropes of the passive, bruised, battered women's images that are made beautiful. You know, somehow violence then, and, and sometimes we see this in some of the posters where, you know, actors and models are, you know, show a battered face, but it is, you know, it's made fashionable symbolically, but how much of that gets translated in, into, into the ground is still something that many of us um, uh, ask a question about. Um, and this also interrogates the long obsession of Western feminists to such images and ponders if sisterhood of saving brown women from brown men um, are all too familiar tropes of political paternalism or like as Laila Bulugo talks, you know, Muslim women don't need saving, um, you know, in, in a similar fashion do, you know, goddesses of the East need saving. Uh, this also comes out of the movement um, of many uh, other monotheistic cultures where they're looking for goddesses um, you know, to resurrect in culturally and symbolically to show uh, power that, uh, you know, the, the, the spiritual power that women have, which is missing in perhaps monotheistic traditions. But well, in the poly polytheistic traditions, we draw from many, and yet almost always you see this women in the pantheistic tradition next to a male consort. You know, she doesn't singularly stand, you know, despite the power, singularly is not revered as a uh, cultural symbol. And finally, how are these relatable to the images of those working class women, you know, low, uh, lower caste, not, meaning the non-upper caste women, or the non-Hindu women, who are also part of the diversity of the nation, and who are also uh, victims slash survivors of violence and misogyny of a patriarchal culture. So those are some of the contexts that need to be kept uh, perhaps in mind when we... Um, and finally, let me uh, uh, quickly go over, uh, you know, uh, one, of the image, one of the posters you see here towards the end of the room. And um, also, yeah, we see all three here, uh, both to the two on your right and one on your, uh, to your left. So the first one um, is about um, the freedom to lead Aung San Suu Kyi by Shepard Freire, which is at the far end of uh, To Your Right. And uh, perhaps many of you know about Aung San Suu Kyi, who was, um, uh, 
Well, Shepard Freire is an American artist who captured the vibrancy and beauty of Aung San Suu Kyi, who was a leader of the pro-democracy movement in Burma, and who was um, under house arrest for 15 years, uh, uh, put in by the military junta there. And until she assumed the position of the head of state, Aung San Suu Kyi emerged as Burma's beacon of democracy, freedom, human rights, and equal rights and nonviolence. And she received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991 for this. And the world rallied you know, behind her for, this, um, uh, for the work she was doing then. Uh, but this is where context is important, today's context. And I'm surprised that you know, the, the curator decided to uh, put this poster out, because currently as we, uh, as we speak, um, Aung San Suu Kyi is indicted, her Nobel Peace Prize, uh, there is rallying cry to revoke her Nobel Peace Prize, uh, uh, citing her silence over the persecution and indifference, and some may even call it the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya people, uh, Burma's protected Muslim uh, minority. And she has taken public stands against uh, a very similar, you might recognize this, uh, her response was, there is violence on both sides. But we now know what that means. You know, violence by the majority and violence by the minority means a you know, world of difference. And that is something that she is at the, at the center of a controversy today. And the question is, is she really uh, the beacon of human rights that we, that we thought she would be when she you know, got power? Uh, the second poster by Barbara Caruso, uh, a Chicana artist and activist who lives and works in LA, critiques cultural stereotypes invoke involving socioeconomics, race, gender, and sexuality. Here she portrays Dolores Huerta. Many of you know her um, fantastic work that she's done in the labor movement, particularly in organizing the United Farm Workers of America. And her clarion call, Yes We Can, was later adopted by Barack Obama. Uh, as part of his um, you know, election slogan, and in 2012 she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And, and definitely a face, um, you know, an icon, um, a feminist icon to remember. Um, and the last poster here, and I'm, I'm going to leave you with this, is um, the faceless indigenous woman. And that, this is a poster to your left at the uh, far end. Here, uh, this um, poster was done by Melanie Cervantes, um, who po whose portrayal of the faceless woman from uh, Central or South America. Uh, she's also the, uh, uh, Melanie is a co-founder of uh, Dijinidad Rebelde, which is a graphic arts collaboration that makes political posters and multimedia projects, which are grounded in the third world and indigenous movements that build people's power to transform the conditions of fragmentation, displacement and loss of culture that results from histories of colonization, genocide and exploitation. So here the artist depicts the stories of struggles and resistance, not as passive victims of oppression, but as fierce actors in the indigenous people's struggle. So you see the, she has the gun on the left hand side and the maze on, uh, on the, in her right hand. And this is the people struggle who uh, struggle to connect sources of life and livelihood and defending those rights through the gun. Again, it's defending and not fighting, right? Not the militia. So, and what is, and this is very evocative of what I'm, uh, I'm trying to gesture about building solidarity because in this faceless, uh, uh, you know, body, we find the call to uh, to collectively rethink building sol what solidarity or what a feminist solidarity looks like or means, and this is across the globe. Indigenous people across the globe are fighting hegemonic powers. So even as we celebrate difference of identities and histories, how do we work with and through these differences to build a long-term sustainable coalition against hegemonic powers of the world? Uh, so I leave you with those, uh, you know, those thoughts about some of the posters here to think and rethink of solidarities that we build across nations and spaces. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Kalaramadam. Okay. okay, I'd like to hold our applause to the end if we can. Okay, Dr. Russell. Yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, as I prepared and pondered today, I thought of today as a time to 
step aside and really focus on the value of women. Um, so that's what I thought about in preparation. So today is really about valuing women, their minds, their epistemologies, their bodies, and simply their being, um, allowing them to be. I'll say that again, allowing them to be. There's a price tag for women just to be a being. Uh, it is a price that many men do not even have to think about paying. Women have to be before a Senate Judiciary Committee hear hearing. They have to be. And let's not forget about the countless women who feel powerless and muted uh, because of their pigmentation, their zip code, and their low pay, wage paying job, who pay every day just to be. So the focus is on just being. So women have had to pay and continue to pay to be in education. And part of my role as a professor here on campus is to uh, groom students to think about ways to empower girls in the classroom, thinking about gender equity, whose voices are heard, how they're heard, and at what, what pace are they heard. So those are questions that I ask students to think about. Along with that is thinking about the positionality, which simply means their cultural background and experiences who, that all shape or mold who they are. So I begin to talk about my positionality and how it shapes who I am. I grew up in a two-parent um, household, and my father was in law enforcement, and my mother was in the health field. Specifically, she worked with STDs, so you can imagine the stories that I've heard, right, and say, no, I don't want to hear any more stories. Um, so we talked about law, we talked about gender, we talked about health and the intersections of that. So that was very early on, and that shaped what was important to me, and that shapes the, the message I bring to the classroom in terms of the presence and the representation of gender in the classroom. So we talk about positionality, and I want you to think about your positionality and what you bring to your courses here at the university and what you even bring to your papers, right? Um, so I, I thought about like how do we even promote gender equality in our lives, or how can I be aware of that? I, I believe first you have to train yourself to see. So you have to train yourself to see, how do you talk about women? How do you consider women? How do you include and regard women and girls in your conversation? And that's for females too. So it's just, not, that's not a question directed to males at all. So how do you weigh those things? Um, so this is a discourse that can't be muffled or ignored. Um, and and um, I also talk about my work um, having mirrors in the classroom, I am supervising a student teacher this semester and I was invited into her classroom last week and she proudly boasted about her, her um, bulletin board in the classroom, which was nicely, neatly done. And of course, I scanned the room and I looked for representations of not only gender but also race. And there were these mammoth, these huge posters of Robert Frost, Edgar Allan Poe, Emily Dickinson. And it was like this small, tiny quote that she created by Maya Angela. I said, there is a cognitive dissonance here. There's something going on here that shouldn't be. So it should be a representation of not only your students, but globally. Let's hear voices from different parts of the world in the classroom. So we have to just be, it's training ourselves to see. So that's part of the work that I do. So she did not, once it was pointed out to her, then it was an aha moment. She clearly saw. So it's about training self to see. And right here, there's a, an image here. Where do you think this may have taken place? You say West Africa? Um, do you want to pinpoint a country, or you just want to just keep it to that region? Excellent. Senegal. I was, um, is it because of my bio? OK. Good guess. That's good deduction. Um, this was on a roadside in southern Senegal, um, an area, a region called Casamas, specifically Ziggenshore, and we stopped to buy some fruit. This is actually called kaba, and I was very um, reluctant to try it, but I did. I did try it, and it was very delicious. It's like lemon, very tart in, in taste. 
and this is a young girl, and um, she, I was amazed by her because it was another young guy, another, it was three in total, and it was a, a male, and I said, wow, this girl is like, she's, you know, handling her business, cutting down these, um, the fruit, and I said, wow, she's just like fierce, and it's no trepidation, and she whipped out a knife, and she's just doing her thing, and I was like, wow, this is like great, you know, no one had to instruct her, she took the lead, um, and I said, look, I want to get a picture of you, you know, so I said, let's get a picture, and I, I, I wanted to even ask her, like, a little bit more about herself. I wanted to even ask her, is she in school? Because, you know, when we talk about education of girls, globally, approximately 65 million um, girls are not in school, and it's a lot of reasons. It's education's not free. It's not mandata mandatory. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of reasons. It may not be such of an emphasis on it. And as um, my colleague talked about, the whole idea of sisterhood, I, I looked at her at that moment as my little sister, and I wanted to encourage her. And I did say some very affirming things to her. Um, and it was a brief encounter. I don't think I'll ever see her again, but I wanted to make some type of impression upon her. Um, so that was important to me. And I think also in terms of our positionality um, and training ourselves to see, that causes a mindset shift to take place. So we have to actively be advocating and believing in women. I made a conscious decision. I'm a mother of three girls, and I made a conscious decision to my husband. I said, look, as we pick out their health care providers, eye doctors, what else? Come on, give me some other... Um, dentistry, what else? Pediatrician. I said, they have to be women. They have to see what uh, Christi Christine Sleeter, a uh, prominent educator, talks about mirrors. They have to see some mirrors. That does not mean that I wanted a world silenced of no males, devoid of males, but I needed them to be affirmed, knowing what they were coming into. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I, it was important for me. Um, and I think also with that, um, we have to, it's things that we can do as students. You might think like, gee, this is important to me. What can I do? Well, you can make, you can quote women in your work, in your papers. You can actively seek to quote them in your papers. So you're doing a research paper, you can quote them. You can include their work in there. You, you can be very conscientious of the clothes you buy. Make sure, maybe even like, okay, I'm gonna buy some clothes by a female designer. So it's things that we can do, as Mother Teresa says, work your corner of the world. So I cannot fix the entire world. The cosmos is too big. I can't do it alone. Who can? But I can work my corner. So what can I do in my own corner where I'm advocating? Am I listening to misogynist lyrics? Am I, what am I doing? So it's back to what am I doing? And that's going to cause the mind shift. And us, as professors, there's things that we can do. I include quotes by women in the syllabus. So that's included in my syllabus, because it's just like my style. So that frames things. So we can do things to, to affirm and give space and place to women. And um, the next, and I think final, um, this is my daughter. And we were volunteering in our neighborhood which is quite rural, um, we live in a country, and um, she was planting a, a rose, um, not a rose, I'm sorry, um, a, a garden there, and um, she took the lead. I, I, I made sure I gave her space to take the lead. No experience in farming, no green thumb, but I had to make a space for her, and I made sure that the director made a space for her. So we were, I was, make, I was creating leading questions, like what do you think we should do next? How can we plant this out where it's spaced appropriately? How can we um, create this bed where it's aesthetically pleasing and also the plants will be able to grow? And she decided to create these, um, Rather, to situate these, uh, I don't know what they call, they're called, but I, I'll, I'll call them hooks or, 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 or I don't know. Beds. Um, huh? Beds. Beds. No, no, I mean these hooks. I can't, I don't know what they're called, but um, she decided to position them that way. Um, and it's back to the notion of females producing their own work. They are being in the center. No one's telling them what to do. 
and just taking time and tap in to the talents that they already have. So something very simple like that, she was affirmed. Again, having no green thumb, no experience with this. So it's things that we can do in our own lives. So I want to leave it at that, and I look forward to any questions you might have or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Russell. OK, moving to Professor Scaleri. Oh, thank you. OK. We also had female doctors for my children. <laughs> so, hmm. You are actually all sitting in my safe space. I was a student here. I graduated in 1983. I was one of the first graduates with a BFA. I was the first year. And I worked in this art gallery for four years. I had a group project at one point, and we went down to the Patterson Falls. And I thought at the time, he had uh, uh, sexually assaulted me, and I always thought I had gotten away with just a head injury. Think about that thought, and that was probably about 1980. I came back to this campus, and there was no help. We didn't have a Teresa Bivolitz back then. We didn't have really a woman's center. And so I just told my best friend. And I realized many years later on, Whenever I would see somebody that resembled him, straight blonde hair, glasses, blue eyes, 5'10", mid-set, I would have panic attacks, I couldn't breathe, and finally realized that the pain in the back of my head, I had lost consciousness, and during that time period, I had been raped. Um, this became my safe space because I worked in this gallery, which meant security always walked by, people always walked by, and on my friend's breaks, because they would realize something wasn't right. People would stay with me to do their homework or keep me company. And this was run back then by Dr. Ironhofer, who's you know, retired, and she always let my friends stay up by the desk. So you're actually sitting in my four-year safe space through college. Um, and so just the strides that we have made and thank you to Teresa and Dr. Sanchez, and also Dr. Scala, because you were instrumental in bringing help to females here, too. But I also um, wanted to talk about the same piece that's been mentioned um, by Cuaro uh, Brera or Rabari, um, about the women in the Jerez Desert that I've been following for many years, so I don't want to repeat some of the things that have been said, but I want to also look at that through a feminist visual arts lens, uh, and which rolled then into a little, to a, a film, Missing Young Women in 2001, uh, produced and directed by Lourdes Portillo, and continued on uh, the this, this same artwork with Diane Calo, a descendant of Frilo Calo, a distant relative, also with the grant, discussing the missing women. But first I would like to take a step back because the feminism art movement that really built momentum in the 60s during civil rights and the feminist movements and things, um, give voice to feminist demands of fem feminist politics, feminist theory, and the exploration of artists. And art makes a viewer think. It's made everybody in this room stop and think and want to know more and question social justice and raise your social awareness. Art makes the world listen and it makes the world take further action. And back in um, April 17th, 1997, the West Desert Mrs. Children was reported in the New York Times at that point of only missing from 1993, 70 children. It went on when Esther Chavez resigned from her job with Kraft Foods in that area as an accountant, as a CPA, and she demanded an investigation into where were these missing women. Um, and she had been doing this since 1995. And she founded the only women's center in that area to help anybody. And by 2005, her unofficial account was 400. And she said no. By the time of her death, she had an estimate of over 1,000 women missing that had been murdered. We still don't even have those numbers confirmed. And that's been since 2009. But the New York Times then reported in December 3rd, 2000, there were only 200 victims. 
we have something missing. We've had convictions overturned, but the um, criminals or alleged criminals are still serving sentences. We've had prosecuting attorneys murdered. We've had a lot of strange things that go on. And his poster, I'm just gonna do a flip forward, came at 2001, the same time that the film was being uh, created, bringing awareness to the amount. And we've already discussed the, the women objectified in body parts and missing and things. Uh, he himself had studied at the National School of Plastics in Cuba. And the range of topics that he covers in his art range from the socio social to the personal expression of urgent problems. And everything around us is crying and urgent. And so I want to go back, though, because in the late 19th century, many of you are probably familiar with Toulouse-Lautrec and you know, his posters of women and dancing in dance halls. But this was his muse. This was Jean Avril. And if we look at her as a dancer, it's sad, it's crude. If we really look at the art, he was reflecting what was happening in, in Paris at the time, what was happening to the women. And then if we see her where he caught her just standing, she looks broken. Edward Degas, everybody knows Marie the ballerina, we know his ballerina scenes, but she was actually the second sister. Her mother had pimped out her and her sister. Uh, I believe her sister had been murdered. And Toulouse-Lautrec, when we look at the ballerinas, you know, we see all his ballerinas and they look so elegant, but it was not an elegant life. And so he, the same as the artists we're looking at now, we're giving this social message, both of them together at the same time in Paris. Um, they're all crying, they're all saying. And the film, Missing Young Women, directed and produced again by Lourdes Bertillo, she herself is an Academy Award nominee. During her time there, she went and she interviewed families from 1999 to 2000 while she was filming. And she had learned that many of the families knew that their daughters had been targeted, sexually harassed at work. There was no place to go. They're desperate for money. They're desperate, desperate people in a desperate situation. And while she was introducing these, introducing these families, 50 more young girls were missing. 50 more young girls just in her time frame while framing were murdered. And that brings me to Another artist, Diane Kahlo, who is, in, is a distant relative of Frida Kahlo. And she um, was funded by the Kentucky Foundation for Women to expose the, war, the Juarez Desert and the missing women and the deaths. And she wanted to put a face to the victims. So when they confirm that uh, a, another young girl has been murdered, and a lot of them are are kidnapped off the buses, they're, they're living on the outskirts, they're traveling to work, traveling back, and they just vanish, and they may find mass graves or one grave. And so she goes to their families to find photos of them, and she's created this exhibit. This was um, photographed at Kane University about two years ago, and she wants to give them their dignity. Here's a closer up of some of the victims. And some are just so young. Some are only children. And here she has created the skulls. There's one skull for every murdered victim. They, are not, they were not all at the exhibit, but she does, she does have them. And so art can roll one from another. So you may have in Paris, you, with Toulouse-Lautrec and Degas, both painting the same systems of oppression they saw. But we also can see here where we're going from, um, let me go back. From this was really, again, from 2001, Eduardo Brower on Barry, to the film, and then to Diane Kahlo, because there's never enough information. So this, the shows have, uh, we have one piece here. This show travels to universities and community centers for arts. But I also, from my Wall Street background, and those of you who've had me, I love to go back to business. 
These are some of the corporations that are there. They're Asian companies, American companies, German companies, Swiss companies. And a lot of them you, don't, you may recognize or they may be holding. So in some of them they might be making the parts for the Ford cars, General Motors cars, Chrysler cars. So there are clothing corporations there that are under other headings so you may not see the exact name of popular apparel but they're coming out of here. We see Johnson's and Johnson's, which headquartered in New Brunswick, they're filled with art that they purchase in fabrics from women that are suffering in Africa, but yet they have their factories here. Citigroup, General Electric, a lot of these you recognize. Xerox, Cisco, Dell computer uh, parts are made there. Johnson Controls, health corporations are there. But one of the biggest offenders on this list is Molex part of the Coke Industries. And for those that you don't know, the Koch brothers, not only are they some of the, 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 the Coke Industries one of the wealthiest in this country and globally, but they are also heavy donors to the Tea Party and the Libertarian Party and pour money into uh, our national and federal government opposed to women's rights. They're right-wing fundamentalists, Christians, and so they have their factories and the war is desert. So things, and I always say this to my classes, always goes back to finance. So if you had to guess, why is this problem just continuing and continuing? Anybody? They save money because they pay almost nothing. You're right, it's almost a slave labor, if it isn't a slave labor, and their profits. Their profits are fantastic. If we pulled up their annual reports, it would be even more upsetting. And so again, you're recognizing all these corporations. I was trying to play around with logos. But rem so the artists, are bringing the awareness. And when you see these things in this exhibit, other exhibits, look further and guess, investigate further. You can always pull these things up from the New York Times and look what's behind it. So we, so, and we're seeing it in all these different uh, posters and pieces of art. Art speaks volumes, art is important. And I know there's a movement now with our, um, our Secretary of Education to take the art programs out, but art is a way to speak, whether it's music or film or visual arts. And those of you that have me, we often go with, uh, to, to the arts, but it's so important. It's another way to express all these systems of oppression and unjustness. Thank you. Thank you. Of the panelists, thank you very much. I mean, we heard themes of violence, empowerment, intersection, intersectionality, contradictions, gender equality, positionality, and so much more. Now, uh, we have prepared questions, but yes, but I'd like to give the students a chance to ask some questions, and then if we have time, uh, I'll ask the prepared questions. Okay? Yes, Dylan. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so with the Kavanaugh hearing and everything, um, there, was, there was this moment in the trial where it sort of, Kavanaugh is this legacy boy, you know, who went through this, this very privileged system and whatnot. And the time he was going to high school and college was a time when women were, they were allowed in the Ivy Leagues, but they weren't necessarily welcome Because you, you see this, you know, uh, for Columbia, for example, women weren't allowed into Columbia University until 1983, I think. In retrospect, very you know, not so long ago. So, do you feel that the sort of air of you know the, the, the fraternities that it was in and the, the sexual assault not being such a big deal to them back then was sort of a response of these legacy boys being threatened of women coming into their environment? And that's just for the panel for where we It happened while he was in high school. It didn't happen while he was in college. He went to Georgetown Prep, 
she went to a different uh, private school, and it happened in a private house. It was still this, this elitist sort of, you know, it was a very elite school he was going to, and then he went into after that, and it was sort of more of the time. This is when, you know, Take Back the Night was happening, and it was just sort of, you know, women were getting more empowered at that time. And so for a very masculine center place, such as an all-boys prep school, do you feel that, you know, this sort of empowerment of women was sort of, it evoked more of a massive response from them. They I, I believe it's how we are socialized, right? Um, there's different standards for males and females in our nation. And then you add race to it, it becomes even more powerful in terms of what's accepted, what's not. It's an atmosphere that's normalized. I can do certain things and it's no repercussions. I'm privileged. I see mirrors of myself all over the place. Somebody can get me out of jail. I can do all sorts of things. I am entitled. So then that, is, that, that seeps through the bloodstream, that, seep, that, that, that comes through the words, that comes through the deeds. I'm untouchable. So I think it's a mindset. It's, it's, it's how one has been socialized, one, how one has been reared. And society socializes us, to another not question. just our parents. Or do you want to comment? Okay. Okay, another question? Yeah. Hi, my name is Maria Moreno. Um, my question is towards for you. Um, so how do you feel, or what is your opinion on how women are being portrayed in animations, such as cartoons or just animated movies? It's, it's amazing because when you have a superhero and it's a male, he has on armor, and they have like a bikini on a female, there's a definite imbalance and it's, it's not healthy. It's not healthy. Right, but like how, um, with so much um, progress, like, you know, that's, um, I feel like there's like different types of changes going on. Like, um, like different types of roles and like different like appearances and stuff like that. Like, um, like how, how do you feel with how the cartoons are like right now for, for women? I don't think I watch enough of them now. Does anybody else? Well, uh, much of uh, the production, you know, it's done by a male. I mean, if you look at the list of producers who make animation continues to be male. The people who write the script for that continues to be male. And perhaps many of you are aware of Anita Circassian who, um, you know, uh, critiques the game industry, gaming industry, and she's come under a lot of attack. She, in fact, was not allowed to speak at the University of, I think, Washington, because they were allowed to bring in guns, and she said, that, no, uh, I'm not uh -huh. risking my life to speak in this campus. So even as a feminist uh, who was critiquing the gaming industry for its patriarchy, misogyny, and sexism, she was under attack rather than the content itself. So as long as there are member, male members of the community who are going to control production, scripting, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the profit-making aspect of that, we will continue to see a resistance from below. But uh, when, you're, when the subalterns are speaking, who is listening, right? When people are resisting, are these people going, oh, well, you can, you can resist out there, but we're going to go do our business as usual because it sells. You know, everything that they put out there, this inequality, the racialization of individuals, the hypersexualization of individuals, the homophobia and transphobia that is part of these, uh, you know, this programming sells to a large audience. So as long as we don't ask for better, it will continue to be making money for somebody out there. Uh, so it does call for a social movement from, from below. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another question? Yes. Hi, um, what are your opinions on immigrants um, trying to come into the nation and their waiting line and once they come here being single mothers and how they have to deal with the consequences of coming to this country and raising children? 
and how they, they don't have the same rights as other single women who are born here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Darlene? Okay. I don't, Darlene, I don't know if you want to take that since you addressed girls earlier in raising children, I believe. So you're asking my position on, 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 um, on the difference between single women, single mothers mm -hmm. in, in the United States who are born here compared to immigrant single mothers? Um, I, um, I, I believe that they should have the same rights. Um, so I don't, I, I am for immigration. This is an immigrant nation. Mm -hmm. um, this nation was built on the um, backs of my ancestors. So this is an immigrant nation. So some people are here by force and some people are here by choice. So this nation doesn't belong to one group of people. So I'm pro-immigration because this is a pro, this is a, an immigrant nation. So I think women, we, we have an issue. We have an issue in Washington we have an issue globally we have it's immigration is a global issue because we, we have folks who are trying to leave their their countries because of um, economic challenges and oppression all sorts of oppression and being turned away we're seeing that in Europe right so I think folks should have access to this nation and other nations things should be in place where it's they can be received and their needs being met so um, you're saying you do believe that there is a difference between single mothers that are born here and single mothers who immigrate here? No, no, I'm saying uh, they should have access to this nation. Um, so I, I um, in terms of those who are born here, they're, they've gone through the actual process of getting their paperwork and being documented. No, um, her heart beats for her children. She has the same kinds of desires for her children as somebody who's undocumented. And I, I just want to add um, to that, having worked at domestic violence shelters, mm -hmm. I can say that all, all shelters, all domestic violence services, um, I can't speak to all of them, but the ones that I have worked with and the ones I know very well, um, so if uh, an undocumented woman comes for services, she will be served. She won't be turned away. She won't be asked uh, for any type of documentation. I you know, have worked with women in shelters who have come fleeing their country because of severe, severe physical violence. And they've come to this country, even you know, as a single woman, single mother, sometimes leaving their children home with other family members to come to the U.S. to you know, seek a different and better life for them, for them, for their children. And so, well, yes, there's, mu there's a lot of disparity when it comes to how people might view documented women versus undocumented women. But I can say for those who have suffered or continue to suffer, whether in their home country or in at least New Jersey and hopefully um, across the nation, uh, seeking services for domestic violence from domestic violence agencies, they, they will receive services, they will receive safety and counseling and advocacy and food and, and diapers and, and so on. Thank you. Just to, can uh, I just, just to add to that? Oh. Go ahead. Okay. No, go ahead. Um, okay. Just to add to that, um, you know, immigration is a very painful process of displacement and moving uh, and journeying. Uh, and most immigrants around the world who are forced to leave will say, we are here because you are there. The U.S. is in many parts of Central and South America pushing out communities and displacing them. And the only place where they seek for a better life is to move towards the metropolitan spaces. So that history and that political economy should be kept on the table all the time and the histories. We are all migrants, you know, the, uh, separated by time. So given the history, the economics, and, and, and the cultural context of immigration is important, and then not to let anyone say that someone did better than the other. It is only because of the context that we created elsewhere that we have immigrants who you know, come here in search of a better life. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, was, I am a single mother for 14, 15 years. I had no alimony, no child support, was in a domestic violence situation. He lost everything. And I've been in out of court for 15 years um, because of unpaid with child support, whatever. There is no difference between a mother that was born here and a mother that was born someplace else, else and has immigrate, immigrated, and I've sat with them, and it's just heartbreaking across the room. The only thing that saved me was that I had a master's, 
but again, I'm in one of the most expensive states in the country, and we need to do more. We are failing as a society that we are not training these women in jobs so that they can live and making their um, citizenship easier for them, but to punish them isn't fair, but they're no different than any other mother. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question. Okay, um, the person in the back. Um, this is for Dr. Russell. Earlier you mentioned how um, we do things to give place to women. What do you mean? Like, Say that louder, say that again. Earlier you mentioned how we do things to give place to women. What do you mean by that? What was um, your aim? To give them space, to give them a spotlight, to give them room. You know, men are at the center in our society. My brother, he, uh, he endured a, ma he was in a major a motorcycle accident. I think I shared that with our class. And I remember in the hospital at this very prestigious hospital in New York City, the entire wall was decorated with the surgeons in that unit, specialized unit, and they were all male faces, white male faces. It was not one female or person of color. So I'm saying that we need to make sure, and I have no control necessarily directly over that, but I have control over the classroom and, and my experiences in my personal life. We need to create spaces where women are the center, they are affirmed, they are a part of the center, uh, maybe not the center, but they are a part of it. So that's what I mean by place. Um, so. I hope that answers your question. Okay. I want to thank all the panelists, and I think it's just amazing. I mean, the breadth of this panel's presentation. We touched on so many issues. And going to the uh, issue of uh, migration, recently many of us participated in the reading of a book about dealing with this issue. And again, we are all migrants. You know, this is a, a just a really, I think, important point to think about and to think also in terms of the issue coming back to what we came together to talk about issues regarding women, oppression, and empowerment. And again, you know, we've touched on so much more. I wish now we had time to engage in so much more conversation. And I'd like to just leave you one of the questions that we didn't get to ask. I wouldn't get to ask the questions we prepared, but one that I'd like you to think about uh, as you leave. What happens when the issues of human rights collide with different cultural standards? That's a question we didn't get to, but it's something to think about, because oftentimes we hear that, right? It's cultural. What's happening to women, to girls? Oh, it's cultural. It shouldn't be touched. Okay, so please thank our panelists.